that night, 10, 18 p.m., witnesses reported hearing a metallic sound and banging timbers, such as made by a falling boom. Immediately afterward, an explosion occurred on the pier and a fire started. With the second blast, 5,000 tons of explosives ripped through the two ammunition ships. The ships, the piers, boxcars, locomotive cargo, and men were all blasted to pieces. The remains of the pier still stand behind me. A pilot flying 9,000 feet above the base reported chunks of metal glowing white and orange shooting far above his plane, some as big as a house or a garage. All 320 of the men on duty at the pier died instantly and 390 civilians and military personnel were injured. Of those numbers, more than half the dead and injured were African Americans, accounting for 15% of all African American naval casualties during the war. The Quinault victory was blown out of the water and the stern landed upside down in the water 500 feet away. Over 300 buildings in the town of Port Chicago, barely a mile away, were damaged, as were most of the buildings on the base. Those sailors off duty in the barracks immediately pitched in, helping search for survivors and putting out fires. Four of these black sailors would receive medals for bravery from Admiral Carlton Wright, commander of the 12th Naval District. Wright also praised those who gave their lives in the service of their country, adding, their service could not have been greater had it occurred on a battleship or beachhead. The African-American stevedores were denied the 30-day survivor's leave that was granted to the officers at the site. Everybody was scared, one survivor recalled. If somebody dropped a box or slammed a door, people began jumping around like crazy. Three weeks after the explosion, the men were at Mare Island while Port Chicago's piers were still being rebuilt. Joseph Small recounted, we were marching along with me on the outside calling cadence. When the lieutenant gave the command, forward, march, column left. Everybody stopped dead. Boom, just like that. Column left meant down to the ferry and over to the ordnance, over to the ordnance loading dock at Mare Island just across the water. So now the officer was sending us back toward the same duty without training as before the disaster. That day, August 9th, what would you have done? 328 black sailors start, stopped marching that day, that moment. Eventually, all but 44 declared that they would load, though six more, including one with a broken arm, would change their mind. These 50 men were thrown in the brig and then court-martialed nearby on Treasure Island, charged with mutiny while all but 70 of the remaining sailors received summary court-martials and had their pay docs $200. What was at stake? Whether or not these men would be found guilty of mutiny depended on the trial's definition of mutiny. And the sailor's definition was quickly thrown out before the court-martial proceedings began. More importantly, if racial prejudice was the reason for the Navy's narrow opinions of Negro sailors, was there a way to, to convey that, even if they lost? I assure you, half these pages are a paperweight. Just before their trial began, Admiral, Admiral Wright called for the all-black ordnance divisions to alternate loading duties with white divisions to make sure that any type of hazardous work is not assigned exclusively to Negro personnel. More important than the charge of mutiny was the sailors' need to convey the gulf between the American cause they defended and the extremely limited options they had for satisfying or surviving their orders. At the trial, many issues were brought up, including the lack of safety information regarding the newer kinds of more sensitive ordnance, faulty equipment, or the junior and the junior officers betting on the tonnage that each division would load per shift as well as those same officers' threats to punish sailors whose crews caused an officer to lose a bet. Ollie Green, Naval Seaman Second Class, testified, the reason I was afraid to go down and load ammunition was because the officers were racing each division to see who put on the most tonnage. 
and I knew from the way they were handling ammunition it was liable to go off again. If we didn't work fast, they wanted to put us in the brig. Thurgood Marshall of the NAACP traveled from New York and met with lawyers on both sides as well as the 50 defendants. He reported they, the Negro sailors, actually don't know what happened. They had no idea the verbal expression of their fear constituted mutiny. They, this is not an individual case, he continued. This is the Navy on trial for its whole vicious policy toward Negroes. Negroes in the Navy don't mind loading ammunition. They just want to know why they are the only ones doing the loading. October 24th, the proceedings ended with 80 minutes of deliberation and a judgment of guilty for each and every one of the 50. The Port Chicago 50 were sentenced to eight to 15 years in prison. They served their sentences beginning in November of 44 and in January 46, just more than a year after they had begun their prison terms. All but three were released with time served, but returned to civilian life with a scar of mutiny on their record. Efforts to overturn the man's convictions have continued since 1944. In 1994, a Navy review panel upheld the sailors' convictions, finding, as Navy Secretary John Dalton wrote, assigning black sailors to manual labor had been clearly motivated by race and premised on the mistaken notion that they were intellectually inferior. But, he continued, that same racial prejudice and discrimination played no part in their court-martial conviction or sentences. A postscript. Of the three men from the Port Chicago 50 who survived into the late 1990s, one of them, Freddie Meeks Jr., applied for and received a pardon from President Bill Clinton in 1999. Uh, second postscript. A little later, in 2002, on the television show J JAG, who's seen JAG? Judge Advocate General. What a crowd. In 2002, on the TV show JAG, season seven, episode 20, if you missed it, a fictitious black sailor asked the help of JAG to get his conviction overturned. On TV, he wins. Not a month goes by at my park, Rosie the Riveter in Richmond, when a visitor during one of my Port Chicago programs pushes back and says, that's not what I saw on TV. In real life, just this past May, an event was held in San Francisco at which people were asked to volunteer and help the effort to overturn the convictions which the Port Chicago 50 still carry. By, 1958, by 1948, when President Harry Truman signed Executive Order 9981, calling for desegregation in the military, the Navy had already made its own declaration two years prior and eight years before the Brown versus Board of Education decision. By 1948, the Navy made more progress toward racial integration than any of the other armed forces. In closing, Port Chicago Naval Magazine is a special site where we honor all those who fight against our country's enemies, but also fight for our country's values. Will everyone who is currently serving or who has ever served in the military please stand or raise your hand? join me. Take a minute to look at these people and join me in giving them a round of applause for the courage. <laughs> and commitment of these men and women. Thank you all of you for your service. What's next and last for me? If you learn anything today from our speakers, from the men who used to work here, or their families, from the former residents of the town of Port Chicago who are with us, then please take those things with you when you leave our time capsule. For all of you, by going back in time with us this morning, can help us inform the present. Thank you. <laughs>